All right, welcome everyone. We're back in John uh, chapter two. This is going to be another powerful, uh, very revealing time in the word again. Aren't you guys glad that the word is not just a surface level thing? Amen. Aren't you glad that there's depth to it? Yeah. Amen. So that you can know the Lord deeper and deeper. What we're doing here in this John chapter two, last time, this time, we're looking deeply into the walk of the Lord Jesus. What do you think he thinks about that? I think he loves that we're taking this time to just stare deeply and gather so many details around his life, to observe them. And when we observe them, not only is our doctrine being set right, but he is somehow transmitting his own life into our spirit, man, for a maturing and a growing in us. So I love looking deeply at the Lord Jesus. And we're going to be in verses 6 through 8, John 2, 6 through 8. Why don't we read that together? Remember, we're at the, uh, the marriage in Cana of Galilee. So let's uh, turn to John Chapter 2, let me know when you guys are all there. Turn there, John 2. Were you ready? Let's read it loud and heartily together. So verses 6 through 8. And there were set there six water pots of stone after the manner of the purifying of the Jews, containing two or three firkins apiece. Jesus saith unto them, Fill the water pots with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he saith unto them, Draw out now, and bear unto the governor of the feast, and they bear it. Okay, let me take a look at this. All right, let's look at the first part of verse 6. Now, keep in mind, what did we see last time when we were together? We saw that Jesus was entering into Cana of Galilee on the heels of overcoming. Mm -hmm. And he overcame in what two ways? He overcame Eve's um, commission of sin. That means the sin she committed, partaking in the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And Adam's omission, sins of omission are the things that the Lord has admonished that you leave out. You omit them. Does that make sense? And Adam had severely failed in leadership. So he omitted his mandate to lead Eve. So Jesus then coming out we looked at that by cross-comparing the Gospels in Luke and seeing how Jesus had come out of the wilderness temptation that he endured under Satan's same communications, the same things he communicated and entrapped Eve with, he was communicating to entrap Jesus with, but he overcame. Now he goes to Cana of Galilee, and he is coming with the victory. But he has to pass through the woman, just like Eve had come before Adam, and Adam had to pass through the trial of the woman. Adam failed. Jesus put Mary properly in her place under him to come under his lead, not to be the usurper and the leader. So now he's fully in the victory, and the resurrection life is going to come forth, and it's going to perform this uh, first act of his glory, turning the water into wine in Cana of Galilee at the marriage. So that's what we're on the heels of here from our last study. Now let's take a look, picking it up at verse 6, after the manner of the purifying of the Jews. So there were set there six water pots of stone. Jesus has now seen those with the eye. How many times, you guys, when you grow in the Lord, you're going to see 
clues around you. Props. You know, the scriptures are a script that everybody's following. And along with a script comes props. And props are the items on the stage that are in line with the script. You get what I'm alluding to? So there's verbal clues, the things that you read and hear in the word, but there's going to be visual clues as well, things that are props. And the more you grow with the Lord and the more your walk increases with him, the more you're going to be in tune with the props as well as the script. And you're going to see how the props and the script go together. And that's what Jesus is going to do here. So visually, he is identifying and seeing six water pots. Now, he knows he's at the feast or the marriage in Cana. That was another clue to him. All of this is bringing to mind scripture to him. We're going to see that today. And that is going to then script and uh, prop come together. And it's going to open his heart to move to fulfill his walk in his destiny. So after the manner of the purifying of the Jews, I want to talk about these water pots real quick because when Jesus sees those, remember, he's coming out of his experience with John the Baptist and the baptizing that was going on. Hey, Howard. Okay. Now, when we covered in John 1 around the baptism of John, we saw that uh, baptism, the word, in any form, baptizes, baptisms, plural, any form of the word baptism or baptize was not found in the Old Testament. And yet in John 1, it's this major event that is not considered new to the Jews, was it? All Judea was coming out to see John. So this idea, though it was not put in word in the Old Testament, was definitely in the hearts and minds of the Jews. So the word is not found. That means it's not said in the Old Testament. It's not said using that word. Go to be here. But baptism, the teaching, is found in the Old Testament very much so. Now, this means it's shown. When something is not said in the word, and a lot of times Christians are going to be, where does it say that in the Bible? Well, sometimes because God's teaching on one level that's very exact to bring you in, Whenever you're dealing with a beginner or what the scriptures would call a novice, think of the church epistles of Paul, who is not to be an elder, a novice. Okay, When you're bringing in a novice, they need things exact. They have to be exact. But when you're bringing in someone who's seasoned, Things don't have to be as exact. They don't have to be as spoken because there's learning that can then be obtained by showing. So what we find is that the idea of baptism is being shown all throughout Israel's history, even though the word is not used. Now, it's become very concise in the New Testament with that word baptism. Because these water pots, they're linking to Jesus coming out of baptism, having been baptized, having fulfilled righteousness. So let's look at this shown baptism in the Old Testament. Uh, Exodus, let's turn to Exodus. And let's go to Exodus 19 and look at starting at Exodus 19.10, where it reads this way. Now, we're dealing with Moses at this point. We're dealing with the dispensation of Israel. 
And he ready against the third day, for the third day the Lord will come down in the sight of all the people upon Mount Sinai. Let me see something. Okay. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go unto the people and sanctify them today and tomorrow, and let them wash their clothes. Okay. This idea of washing that is all over the Old Testament is taking you into the understanding of baptism. The Jews were crazy about washing. The idea of cleansing, being made clean. All right, take a look next at Exodus 29, 4. Let's go to 29, 4. Mm -hmm. So all the people were, were to wash and wash their clothes. And here it says, And Aaron and his sons thou shalt bring unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation and shalt wash them with water. So here the priests are being washed with water. Now the washing with water is a baptism. When you wash your clothes, you're baptizing your clothes. When you wash your body, you're baptizing your body. Amen? Amen. Oh, let's look next. A few verses into Exodus 29 again later. Uh, verse 17. 29, 17. And thou shalt cut the ram in pieces and wash the inwards of him and his legs and put them unto his pieces and unto his head. So here the sacrifice that's about to be burned <clears throat> has been washed. This is how extensive the washings were. The people were washed. As at large, the priests were washed. But even the sacrifices themselves were washed, baptized. So this idea of washing and cleansing is all through Israel's history. It saturates it very, very much. Now, the whole book of Leviticus is all about washing and cleansing. There's no book in the Bible that is going to use the word wash more than the book of Leviticus because it's all about the priestly order, how to handle it, the sacrifices, etc. No book compares to Leviticus to use the word wash. Remember, we're talking about baptism now. And baptism is a washing. It's an expression of cleansing, okay? So this is what we see then in Leviticus. In Leviticus, and Leviticus is going to be considered our priestly book. Doing the work of a priest it has to do with the people as well because what is subject to the priests the people. And look at this. This is just by way of King James Bible perfection. But the word wash in Leviticus is going to appear 36 times. I'm going to show you these links. 36 times the word wash appears in Leviticus. As you grow in understanding how God uses numbers and how everything he says is not random, but specific, you're going to learn how to see the things he's showing in the big picture. So obviously, in the day when Leviticus was written, it was in Hebrew, which means the English was deep within what Moses was writing. To come out, perfectly with 36 times using the word wash. Now, when we look at 36, we should see a three plus six. And that gives us, of course, nine. And when you see the nine, which is the fruit number, you, you've reached a fullness of a number at nine, because it's the fruit bearing. It means it's about to tip its fruit. 
When the woman turns nine months pregnant, she's about to tip her fruit and the fruit is going to come forth. So whenever you see your nine, you know you're dealing with a one plus six plus one plus one. 1611, your 1611 King James Bible. Okay. So you say, well, okay, I can see that. But what you really need to see is how that connects with the fullness of the word. If you go to Ephesians 5, 26, now here we're talking about Israel. I'm going to put a big I for Israel here. But let's look at the church now. Put a big C for the church right there. Look at Ephesians 5, 26. And look at how the washing now is fulfilled. So here it was in prophecy with 36 times using the word wash. Now it's being fulfilled in the church in Ephesians 5, 26, where it says that he, that's Jesus, might sanctify and cleanse it, that's the church, with the washing, there's your wash word, of, or by, rather, by the word. You see that? that? He may wash, look at 36 times Leviticus, he's doing, when the husband washes the wife by the word, He's doing a priestly service unto her. He's a priest husband. Does that make sense? He's a priest husband. And he washes her by the word. That's what Christ is doing to the church. He's washing the church by the word. You see the connections there? I hope you all see that. We can just move on, right? Yeah. You all see how clear that is? Yeah. And when you can receive the King James Bible as the perfect words of God, you can see that and just admire it and keep going. That's powerful. That's great how God's done this. So baptism equates to cleansing and washing in the Old Testament. So now you'll know every time when you see baptism in the New Testament, this has its roots, even though the word's not used anywhere in the Old Testament, with all of the uses of washing, which is the matter of cleansing, right? Okay, good. So when Jesus sees the water pots, after having been washed or cleansed or baptized by John to fulfill all righteousness, because this all had to do with righteousness, right? had to be cleansed for righteousness. Ultimately, we're cleansed by the blood and we're cleansed by the word, both. 1611 King James Bible. So when he sees the water pots, he knows he must cleanse Israel by his blood. Because what's going to happen to the water that's going to fill it? It's going to turn into wine. Wine is very symbolic in the Bible of blood. You see how the props are speaking to Jesus? We're going to see how the scriptures are speaking to him and the props together. Because he can hear from God. His hearing from God is always in the word. All right, let's go to C here. Now... Look at John 131, which we have covered. We've already gone through John chapter 1, but let's go back for a second. In verse 131, it says, And I knew him not. This is John the Baptist speaking. And I knew him not, but that he should be made manifest to Israel. Therefore am I come baptizing with water. So, baptism, real quick. Baptism, because we've taught on this when we went through this. What is that passage telling you about why Jesus was baptized? To reveal Christ. Baptism was to reveal Christ to the church, right? <clears throat> to Israel. You see that? Why does the church always put such this major emphasis on water baptism? Tradition. 
not rightly dividing the word, not understanding how. Each dispensation has its own role, character. It turns into that by, by an overwhelming expression, yes. It turns into a very worksness. We don't need to be washed in water. We need to be washed in the King James Bible. That's Ephesians 5. That's the apostle to the Gentiles' instructions to the church. Never, never telling them that they need to be baptized with water. How many people you know who are baptized with water, their walk is in shambles? It just doesn't matter. Or you're not even sure they're a Christian. It just doesn't even matter. When they think once they were baptized, it was done by the Yeah, because it's a work, like Stephen was saying. It's well, a yeah, work. It's even even yeah. the Catholics, they don't even remember being baptized. They have to take their parents' word for it. Oh, you were baptized when you were six months. Yeah. Okay. So I'm bringing this out to tie this in, especially because you need to understand it's the truth. Israel was washed with water. Israel was washed with water. Israel had all of the types. Israel had all of the shadows. What do we have, church? The types and the shadows or the reality? We have the cleansing of the blood. Did they have the cleansing of the blood of Christ? No. They didn't have that, did they? No. Their washing was with water. What about our washing? Well, it's right here. It was prophesied in there, and we've received it. Washing by the word, Ephesians 5, 26. So note that. Baptism, specifically identified by God as being with the purpose in mind, to identify Messiah to Israel. I'll just leave it at that. The church washed by the reality of Christ. We have everything that's real. But to Jesus, he understood with those water pots that the people will need to be cleansed. But they're going to need to be cleansed by his blood. So for him, he is seeing the direction of the cross. Now, let's go to uh, part three, and let's go to verse seven and eight in John two. Now here, he begins to move, right? Look at seven. Jesus saith unto them. He's moving now. He's taking action. We're all there? John two, seven. Jesus saith unto them, fill the water pots with water. He's giving instruction. He's moving now. The scriptures have spoken to him. The props are speaking to him. This is sight and sound because he's so in the walk with the father. And he's identified exactly what's about to take place. And he's going to now fulfill the reality of Elisha, the prophet. Nobody knows what's going on but Jesus and the Father. No one around has any idea what's about to take place. And they have no idea where it's coming from. Only Jesus and the Father understand and know. We're going to see Jesus moving mm -hmm. as the true Elisha. So as we do that, we need to look at Elijah first. Because who comes before Elisha? Yeah. Elijah. Elijah. Then Elisha comes with the double portion. Matthew eleven fourteen. Let's read that. Go to Matthew eleven fourteen. Now the figure of Elijah has come. Do you all know who I'm talking about? John the Baptist. That's right. Jason's in tune here. In 11.14, this is what Jesus said about John the Baptist. And if you will receive it, this, speaking of John the Baptist, is Elias, which was for to come. So Jesus is saying, if you can receive it, knowing that Malachi prophesied that before the coming of the Messiah, John the uh, Elijah would come, if you can receive it, John the Baptist fulfilled that. Hey, 
You're going to tell Jesus he's spiritualizing the scriptures? <laughs> because I hear that from people all the time. Oh, well, you can't spiritualize. We tell Jesus to stop spiritualizing and making John the Baptist Elijah here. I dare you. So we do have Elijah in our narrative of John 1 and 2 flow. There's Elijah right there. If you can receive it, there he is. So who's going to naturally follow Elijah? Elisha. Elisha. That's right. This is why now Jesus is going to come forth with the double portion as Elisha. So you see how the props are all signaling him? I want you to see this, guys, because don't think the things going on around your life and in your life aren't signaling you. You're just blind. God's speaking all the time, all over the place. He's wrapped himself around your life. I'll be out places and I'll know exactly what I'm supposed to do or exactly what I'm supposed to say because of the props and the word working together. And when you grow, you're going to move in this too because Jesus moves in this way. If Jesus moves in this way, when you grow, you will move in this way yourself. You're going to see it all come. So he's seen Elijah in John the Baptist. And now he's at the wedding feast at Cana. He's about to connect the scriptures. And he knows now comes Elisha. So he's identifying those water pots. And they're taking him to a specific chapter of the Bible that he's going to then walk out and carry out and have the fullness of it in himself. Remember, God is always making the fullness of everything in himself. Mark 9, 12, and 13, we looked at Matthew eleven fourteen. 14. If we go to Mark 9, 12, and 13, I just want to show you again, in passing, and he answered and told them, Elias verily cometh first, that's Elijah, and restoreth all things, and how it is written of the Son of Man that he must suffer many things and be set at naught. So when he understands that Elijah comes first, knowing John the Baptist, you see how it says, and suffer many things? He knows he is set to go to the cross. He is on a journey to fulfill many things on his way to fulfilling the ultimate, which is the cross. So there's pen ultimates. We're going into a pen ultimate right here. That's underneath an ultimate. But that ultimate will be the cross. And you see how he's connecting Elijah with suffering? He knows. It's triggering him according to this clue right here in Mark 9, 12, and 13. All right. Let's go to B. Who follows Elijah? Elisha does. Jesus is now coming forth in the double portion like Elisha was. Remember how Elisha had the double portion? Elijah was great, and Elisha was a double portion. One, Jesus is taking his lead according to the scripture, not according to Mary. Remember what Mary had previously done. She was trying to lead him. Jesus is not on her timetable or any man's timetable. He's on the Father's timetable. He will only do according to the Father. That means according to the Word. And the word will grant him the open way to go ahead and go forward and do the miracle that he's about to do. But it's not going to be because Mary prompted him. We covered that last week. So Jesus is taking his lead according to the scripture, not according to Mary. That takes us to 2 Kings 3. So let's turn there. We're going to spend a lot of time in 2 Kings chapter 3. Now remember, Jesus' response to Mary was, woman... What have I to do with thee? This was in verse 4a of chapter 2 of John. Jesus is moving intentionally toward the cross. And we're going to see that in 2 Kings 3. He says to Mary, mine hour is not yet come. After he says, woman, what have I to do with thee? He says, mine hour is not yet come. 
come. He is speaking of the hour that he will be glorified. And that has everything to do with the cross. So I'm going to ask everyone in this room, all of you, are you committed to the trajectory of your life being the direction of the cross? I hope so. Because if you're walking in Christ, that's going to be your trajectory. You may be in the early stages, wherever you are. Here, Jesus is in the early stage. He's just beginning his ministry walk. But he's already fixated on the cross. Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. Mine hour. That right there. It's telling you, he already knows where he's going. The scriptures have directed him. All right, next page. We're going to compare 2 Kings 3, which you turn to, because Jesus is going to draw everything that takes place at the wedding, this marriage in Cana, all of it is going to take place out of 2 Kings 3. He already knows the script, guys. He knows the props and he knows the script. But nobody around him has any idea. No one has any idea. All right. 2 Kings 3, you're going to want to keep your finger there and you're going to want to keep your finger in John chapter 2 because we're going to go back and forth. I got to turn there myself. 2 Kings 3, we're going to start at the very beginning of 2 Kings. So we have the context of what's taking place. And every time one of these verses comes up, we're going to stop to talk about it. Okay, here we go. Now Jehoram, the son of Ahab, began to reign over Israel in Samaria, the 18th year of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, and reigned 12 years. And he wrought evil in the sight of the Lord, but not like his father and like his mother, for he put away the image of Baal that his father had made. So here we have a king who's evil, but not quite as evil as his parents. Nevertheless, he cleaved under the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nabat, which made Israel to sin. He departed not therefrom. Now it's at this point here, verse four, where Jesus is identifying that he is to walk out this passage in his life and fulfill the type of Elisha. And Misha, king of Moab, was a sheep master and rendered unto the king of Israel an hundred thousand lambs and an hundred thousand rams with the wool. Okay, let's take a look at this here. What you've got is the king of Israel has the king of Moab in a tributary status. Do you know what that means? This means that he can reign as a king of Moab, but he must pay tribute to a higher king. And the tribute here, as, as revealed, Misha, king of Moab, was a sheep master and rendered, that means he paid, unto the king of Israel 100,000 lambs and 100,000 rams. So he had to pay to the king of Israel this tribute. It was like tribute money. And Jesus is already locked on that what's taking place is 2 Kings chapter 3. So he's seen right here already there needs to be a lamb and a ram. That's the death. That's the death. That goes all the way back to the sacrifices of Leviticus. We talked about Leviticus. And Jesus is locking on that he is that lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Who had just spoken that? In John chapter 1. John the Baptist had just spoken that. But he's not only to be the lamb and the ram, he's to supply the wool. Now that's something positive. 
The negative in seeing the lamb and the ram is the sacrifice going to the cross. But the wool is for the covering, to cover his people. Does that make sense? That's the positive. But you cannot cover the people without being the lamb or the ram, the lamb of God, and dying for the sins of the people. So again, we see that Jesus is identifying his direction. He's got the trajectory of the cross in mind. So to him, 2 Kings chapter 3 is all about him being the supply of the Lamb of God. You see that? All right. The necessity for the Lamb and the Ram to come forth as the sacrifice, but also the necessity for the wool to cover. And that's a kickback to John 1, 29. The next day, John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. That had just previously occurred. So already 2 Kings 3 is coming into a dovetail with John 1, and it's going to go full force in John chapter 2. Full blown in John chapter 2. All right. Let's keep reading. We're at verse 5. So because he stopped paying tribute, something needed to be done. There was a rebellion that was beginning to take place against the king of Israel. But it came to pass when Ahab was dead that the king of Moab rebelled against the king of Israel. Verse 6. So that was the reason why he considered it an opportunity to rebel at the change of guard and to stop paying tribute and giving all of the Lambs and rams. Verse 6, And King Jehoram went out of Samaria the same time and numbered all Israel. So here, he is going to do something about this rebellion. He's going to go and prepare to fight to get this king back under the status of paying tribute. And he went and sent to Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, saying, The king of Moab hath rebelled against me, Wilt thou go with me against Moab to battle? So he's trying to make an alliance here with a brother. Remember Israel and Judah are brothers. And he said, I will go up. I am as thou art, my people as thy people, and my horses as thy horses. And he said, which way shall we go up? And he answered, the way through the wilderness of Edom. Now they're planning their attack on Moab to bring them back into submission. Now, verse 9. Now, we're going to really see John 2 from here on out and the marriage at Cana emerging. Jesus is going by the script, guys. So the king of Israel went, and the king of Judah, and the king of Edom, and they fetched a compass of seven days' journey, and there was no water for the host and for the cattle that followed them. Now, look at that. Verse 9, and there was no water. Now compare that with John 2, 2 and 3. It says they have no wine. See the similarity? Yeah. They have no wine. All right. Verse 10 in 2 Kings 3, and the king of Israel said, alas, that the Lord hath called these three kings together to deliver them into the hand of Moab. Now remember, this is an evil king, this king of Samaria. He's an evil king. King Jehoshaphat is with, king of Edom is with. And he's thinking, we're out here now on this journey with our troops. We've got no water. The Lord has done this to us to entrap us, that we will die out here in the way. 11, but Jehoshaphat said, is there not here a prophet of the Lord that we may inquire of the Lord by him? And one of the king of Israel's servants answered and said, here is Elisha, the son of Shaphat, which poured water on the hands of Elijah. So you see here now, Jesus is identifying himself as the true Elisha to go forward in this passage. In his day, in his time. 
verse 12. And Jehoshaphat said, the word of the Lord is with him. So the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat and the king of Edom went down to him. So now they're approaching Elisha. Now, verse 13, we're going to see an obvious clue into John 2. And Elisha said unto the king of Israel, what have I to do with thee? What have I to do with thee? Did we not hear that in John chapter 2? Look at, get thee to the prophets of thy father and to the prophets of thy what? Who's in John chapter 2? It says specifically the mother of Jesus is at the marriage. We have the exact same words. And the king of Israel said unto him, Nay, for the Lord hath called these three kings together to deliver them into the hand of Moab. So verse 13, what have I to do with thee? And then the word mother. John 2, verses 3 and 4, has the word mother. And then it says, woman, what have I to do with thee? Do you see how Jesus is locking into this? He knew the scriptures so deeply. And his life was all found in the scripture. This is where, as you grow in Christ, your whole life is found in the scripture. All right, we're at verse 14. And Elisha said, as the Lord of hosts liveth, before whom I stand, surely were it not that I regard the presence of Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, I would not look toward thee nor see thee. Now, isn't this the initial spirit of response that Jesus had to Mary in telling her no? He's telling her no. And this is what Elisha is saying. Elisha is saying, I wouldn't do it for you if it weren't for him, Jehoshaphat. Elisha did not like the Samarian king because he was evil. And this was a righteous prophet. But Jehoshaphat was a good king. And so for his sake, he's going to comply. I just want you to see there's a, a dissidence that took place between Jesus and Mary. And there's a dissidence that's taking place here at the request, even using the same words. All right. We're on to verse 15. Now look at this. But now, and here's Elisha's request. But now bring me a minstrel. And it came to pass when the minstrel played that the hand of the Lord came upon him. What's a minstrel? A right, a musical instrument, right? Of one who plays a musical instrument. What's happening in John chapter two? There's a marriage going on, right? Oh, yeah. And a feast. What kind of environment is that? It's a musical environment. Have you ever gone to any wedding that does not have music? Tony, you went to one? Okay. Yeah. But he's, he's the exception that, that makes the rule. You know what I mean? He's the exception that makes the rule. <laughs> All right. But, but guys, you've got to connect the props. I want you to see the props going around Jesus. Jesus is at this marriage, and he's hearing the music. He's seeing the water pots. <clears throat> He's seeing that Elijah has come and that Elisha must follow. Do you see how it's all forming for him the vision of 2 Kings 3? Mm -hmm. He knew to go to this passage to draw on it for his walk to fulfill mm -hmm. the scriptures. It's quite amazing how in tune Jesus was. This is what we want to appreciate because this is how we're growing in him. All right. So he hears the music. He sees the water pots. Verse 16 in 2 Kings 3. And he said, thus saith the Lord, make this valley full of ditches. Now, do I need to say anything there? Or do you see it? Water pots, ditches. Mm -hmm. Earthen, earthen vessels, water clay. clay, the water pots are earthen vessels. 
The ditches are earthen vessels mm -hmm. for containing water. You see how exactly he's seeing all of this? Make this valley full of ditches. Verse 6 in John 2, and there were set there six water pots of stone, earthen vessels. Okay? So Elisha has given the instructions of what's to be done, and Jesus is giving instructions of what's to be done. We're on verse 17 on 2 Kings 3. For thus saith the Lord, you shall not see wind, neither shall ye see rain, yet that valley shall be filled with water that ye may drink both ye and your cattle and your beasts. Okay, now look at, we just read that valley shall be filled with water. That was verse 17. In John 2, at verse 7, Jesus says, fill the water pots with water. It's the exact same thing, guys. Totally, identically, exact same thing. Now, furthermore, in 17, it says that ye may drink. This is what Elisha said, that ye may drink. When we get to verse 9 in John chapter 2, it says the ruler of the feast had tasted the water. There's your drinking. All right, 2 Kings 3, on to verse 18. It says, and this is but a light thing in the sight of the Lord. He will deliver the Moabites also into your hand. So Elisha is saying that this miracle of digging the ditches and then they're going to fill with water. Without rain, they're going to fill with water. He's saying this is but a light thing. Look at this in John chapter 2. This is but a light thing in the sight of the Lord. John 2, 11 says the beginning of... This beginning of miracles did Jesus. See, the turning water into wine at Cana was not a major achievement. As in, whew, got that done. Glad I got that done. That was tough. Can't do that again. You see how beginning of miracles is connecting with this thought that it's a light thing for the Lord? Think of all the miracles that were going to come forth out of Jesus. This that was being done at Cana was a very light thing for the Lord to do. This is totally following 2 Kings 3. All right, we're at verse 19. And ye shall smite every fenced city and every choice city. So Elisha is promising the victory to the kings. And shall fell every good tree and stop all wells of water and mar every good piece of land with stones. And it came to pass in the morning when the meat offering was offered that behold, there came water by the way of Edom, and the country was filled with water. And when all the Moabites, now here's the opposite end, the Moabites. And when all the Moabites heard that the kings were come up to fight against them, they gathered all that were able to put on armor and upward and stood in the border. And they rose up early in the morning. Now look at this. And the sun shone upon the water, and the Moabites saw the water on the other side as red as blood. <clears throat> there you go. Bam. Wow. There it is. The water, red as blood. Jesus interpreted that as the call to action for him to turn the water into wine. You think it was white wine? You think it was a burgundy? A Chablis? It was a dark red wine. You know how we know? Because the scriptures tell you. Comparing scripture with scripture, line upon line, here a little and there a little, God shows you. Does God tell you it was red wine in John chapter 2? No. No. Shows you in 2 Kings 3. Remember how I told you earlier? The novice has to have everything said. Where does it say that? that? When we grow in the Lord, it's not just what's said, it's what's shown. Okay? When we looked earlier at the word wash 36 times in Leviticus, which is the book of washings, 
knowing that that's a three plus six, giving you a nine, which is 1611, one plus six plus one plus one. Does the Bible tell you that? It shows you that. But the novice can't receive that and connect it with Ephesians 5.26, being washed by the water of the word, 16.11. You see? Not everything is said. Many of the greatest things God will reveal must only be shown. Okay, what verse are we on in 2 Kings 3? Okay, we're on 24. And they said, this is blood. The kings are surely slain, and they have smitten one another. Now, therefore, Moab to the spoil. They're convinced that they're looking at ditches of blood. And they think that the kings have slain one another, that something has taken place. It caused some kind of revolution and that they've killed one another. So they're ready to go to the spoil. Okay. And... <coughs> I want to show you something before we go on in verse 23 when they say this is blood. Look, in 22, it says the sun shone upon the water. Now, I want you to compare that with in John chapter 2, verse 9. Who has John 2? Read verse 9. Okay, so look at this. The sun shone upon the water. That is an explanation as to why the water appeared as blood, right? That's an explanation. When you read in John 2, 9, you'll see that there's one party that has an explanation. It said the servants which drew the water knew, right? They knew what had taken place. They knew how that water had become wine at the order of Jesus. So you have one party that knew, just like in 2 Kings here. The explanation is right here. There's a party that knows. But then it says in 23, the Moabites saw the water as red as blood. Now this is a party that doesn't have an explanation. They don't understand why they're seeing what they're seeing. And compare that in verse 9 in John 2 with the governor, the ruler, knew not whence it was. So the servants, on the one hand, they knew. There was the explanation. The ruler of the feast who drank... <clears throat> knew not now you have do you see the balance one one understands and one doesn't well look at what verse that is too i want to read that john 2 verse 9 because we've already talked about nine right the 36 times wash is used in leviticus more than anywhere in the bible three plus six being nine which is a one plus six plus one plus one for your 1611 in john 2 9 when the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine and knew not whence it was, but the servants which drew the water knew. There's your unexplained party and your explained party. The governor of the feast called the bridegroom. Now look at this, this is verse 9, where the water is made wine, revealed to be made wine. Verse 9, this is pointing you again to your 1611, where the water is turned into wine. All of the Bibles of history that were growing and making their way are really turned into wine in the 1611. Because you have your nine again, your verse nine. It's in the verse nine slot for a one plus six plus one plus one. 
These placements of God are intentional. And as you're seeing Jesus connecting everything from scripture with his own circumstances, you know how perfect all of this word is. All right. 2 Kings 3, verse 23, and they said this is blood. The kings are surely slain, and they have smitten one another. Now, therefore, Moab to the spoil. When they came, we'll just finish this out. And when they came to the camp of Israel, the Israelites rose up and smote the Moabites so that they fled before them. But they went forward smiting the Moabites, even in their country. And they beat down the cities on every uh, good piece of land, cast every man his stone, and filled it. And they stopped all the wells of water and felled all the good trees. Only in Kirbarasheth left they the stones thereof. Howbeit the slingers went about and smote it. And it just goes on and on how they drove the king out. So they had the total victory. But Jesus is seeing this. And this is what he's walking out as the true Elisha in John chapter 2 at the wedding in Cana. Now, do you know how many Christians will read the wedding in Cana, the marriage in Cana? And think it's brand new. It has nothing to do with the Old Testament. Obviously it does. Surely it does. All right, let's go on to the next page. So we saw Jesus illuminated by the scripture to his first and second coming. He knows that he's going to be the lamb of God to take away the sin of the world. This water being turned to wine is to him symbolic of his death on the cross where he is going to be providing blood. Wine to him is blood. He's going to be providing blood to cleanse Israel. And for that matter, to cleanse the Gentiles. And he's moving in this, in the power of Elisha. So the first coming glory of the cross. See what it says in John 2, 11? John 2, 11, this beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee and manifested forth his glory and his disciples believed on him. This is about glory. Being in the trajectory of the cross is glorious. God has put an economy upon the purpose of death. There is a purpose to death. There is a purpose to dying to self. It's not a uh, masochistic act that you do because it bears resurrection. We covered that last week. After death comes resurrection. So even now, as we're dying to self, the resurrection life of the Lord is budding in and through us and coming forth. But we must be faithful to have the trajectory of that same walk. Okay? Now, the second coming of Jesus is also glory. But you can't have the second coming glory without the first coming glory, the glory of the cross. Paul says in Galatians 6 that he wouldn't glory in anything but the cross. You can read that later. Anything but the cross. And furthermore, he said that if we suffer with him, we will glory with him, reign with him, rule with him. So you have to have in your walking with the Lord, the activity of going in the movement of the cross. It's not earning your salvation. We know that. But there is a practical fulfillment of an itinerary that has to take place within your spirit, man, to prepare you. This glory of the cross preparing you for the glory to return. When he's revealed, we shall be revealed. And that's going to be glorious. Now, this second coming glory is a vengeance. The first coming glory is as the Lamb of God to be 
displaying the mercy of God and the kindness of God. Then in the church, the dispensation of the grace of God. But the second coming glory is going to be vengeance. And that will be glorious. His vengeance will be glory. <clears throat> and that's also in the second Kings chapter three that we cover. I don't have time to go through all of that. I'm going to give you a taste of it. If you look at 2 Kings 3, 8, and if you want to do this on your own, go through 2 Kings 3. I led you through to show you the first coming of Jesus and the wedding at Cana, the marriage at Cana. You can go through this on your own. And if you know the scriptures, you'll see that not only the first coming of Jesus fulfilling Elisha is there, but his second coming is also in this passage. That means that Jesus is identifying both at the marriage in Cana. He's seeing both. He knows he is going to hit the bullseye of glory, and they're both being shown here. So in 2 Kings chapter 3, if you look at verse 8, just for example, uh, there's and there's so many examples. 2 Kings 3, 8, it says, and he said. Now remember, the kings are going to go to battle against Moab. And they're saying, what way do we take? They're convening. They're having counsel. What is our, our path? 2 Kings 3.8. And he said, which way shall we go up? And it's to go up to fight. What happens at the Lord's return? It's going to be the greatest fight that ever was. Which way shall we go up? And he answered, the way through the wilderness of Edom. And take a look at this, Isaiah 61, 1 through 6. This is talking about Revelation 19 and the return of the Lord, the glory of the second coming. And look at what Isaiah 61, 6 reads. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, 1 through 6. I'm going to turn there. I'm going to read the whole thing. It's six verses. To turn there, Isaiah 61. If you know anything about Isaiah 61, you know it's a return chapter, verses 1 through 6. Isaiah 61, 1 through 6. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord hath... And as I read this, I want you to listen for the wedding at Cana, okay? Listen for the marriage at Cana. You're going to hear Edom, which was from 2 Kings 3, the way they're going to take. Then you're going to hear the word glory. Remember this beginning of miracles? Jesus did for his glory. You're going to hear the word wine. You're going to hear the word blood. You're going to hear the word vengeance. The second coming is all in 2 Kings chapter 3. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted and to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are, I'm sorry, 63. Did I put a 61? Yeah. Scratch 61. I just have a typo on my notes. It's 63. Okay, change that to 63, 1 through 6. So look at this, describing the return of the Lord. That was, that was his first coming in 61. The second coming is in 63. Who is this that cometh from Edom? This is literally, guys, tracing for you the Lord's aerial return and his path. Andronicus, what do you call a flight path? Flight path. Yeah, thank you. I just look at you and I got the answer. <laughs> <coughs> this is literally the flight path that the Lord's going to take as he comes out of heaven for the slaughter. Who is this that cometh from Edom? Remember, that was in 2 Kings 3. That's the path they're going to take. With dyed garments from Basra. This that is glorious in his apparel. There's your glory. Traveling. In the greatness of his strength, I that speak in righteousness, mighty to save. Wherefore art thou red in thine apparel and thy garments, like him that treadeth in the wine fat? There's your wine. I have trodden the wine press. There it is again, alone. And of the people, there was none with me. For I will tread them in mine anger and trample them in my fury. And their blood, there's the blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments. Because remember, Jesus is seeing that wine as blood in John 2. For the people, it's going to be a rejoicing. 
<clears throat> Wine maketh the heart of God and man rejoice. The scriptures tell us that in Judges. It's not the word rejoice, glad. So isn't the blood of Jesus in his first coming, doesn't that make you glad? Isn't it like a wine to you? Knowing that you're cleansed in the blood of Jesus from all wrath to come, saved by his blood, Romans 5, 9. Okay, their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments and I will stain all my raiment for the day of vengeance is in mine heart. See, this is the second coming glory. And the year of my redeemed is come. And I looked and there was none to help. And I wondered that there was none to uphold. Therefore, mine own arm brought salvation unto me and my fury, it upheld me. And I will tread down the people in mine anger and make them drunk. There's the wine again. In my fury, and I will bring down their strength to the earth. So you can see that Jesus is not only seeing his first coming and what's taking place in Cana, but at what's taking place in Cana, he's also seeing his second coming when he's going to turn it into another episode of wine or blood. And it's going to be a blood bath upon the world. Mm -hmm. That will be beyond the gladness of wine. When you're beyond the gladness of wine, you're drunken in a stupor, falling down. And that's what's going to happen at the second coming. They'll stagger like drunk men as the Lord slaughters. All right, the deep and severe application of the scriptures in Jesus' walk. He's walking as Elisha. And we're walking in Christ. Jesus was carrying out the true Elisha. He was the fulfillment of it. And Christ is manifesting himself in us to walk in Christ. That the world meet Christ. They met Elisha at that wedding at Cana. How many there do you think said, we have just met Elisha? Do you think any of them said that? How many there said, wait a minute, this is 2 Kings chapter 3. How many of them there said that? <laughs> zero. Probably zero. When Mary heard, what have I to do with thee? Do you think she said, Whoa, 2 Kings 3 is unfolding here. I'm, I'm the mother that 2 Kings 3 talks about. Get you to the prophets of thy mother. You see, you see how much is taking place around you fulfilling the scriptures? You have no idea, guys. You have no idea. You have no idea how many of the things in your life are props that God completely understands and makes sense of. And you will too, as you grow in the word. Isaiah 50, we're going to close with these scriptures, four and five. The Lord God hath given me the tongue of the learned. This is speaking of Messiah. That I should know how to speak a word in season and to him that is weary. And then it says this. He wakeneth morning by morning. He wakeneth mine ear to hear as the learned. The Lord God hath opened my ear and I was not rebellious, neither turned away back. See, the ear of Jesus was opened to hear what was going on in John chapter two from the word to know what manner he ought to walk in. You must have spiritual ears, not carnal, guys, for reading the scriptures. In Psalm 40, verse 7, speaking of Messiah again, Then said I, lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me. Why I spend so much time in the word is because if I'm in Christ, and the volume of the book speaks of Christ, and the volume of the book speaks of me when I'm understanding it objectively and correctly. And that takes training from the Father. 
the discipline of the Holy Ghost in our life. The correcting of the scriptures. We're in the word much because much correction needs to be taking place in your understanding of the scriptures. You must have spiritual ears, not carnal, for reading the scriptures and gaining your objective calling. Minaj said to me last Sunday, what he's never forgotten from our meeting in time is that it's not about God's will for my life. It's about God's will, period. What is God doing? That I may be in the flow of the objective will of God and get rid of all of the riffraff theology, the riffraff Christianity that makes it all about you and your idiosyncrasies of your life. The Father is pruning those things away by teaching you the objective truth of God. Pruning them away. All right. I'll hold my peace there. We'll go on in John chapter 2 again next week. Praise the Lord.